So I think we are live. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this high-level webinar on Serbia's EU accession process on behalf of the Klingendal Institute and also on behalf of the Serbian Embassy in The Hague with whom Klingendal organizes this event together. My name is Wouter Zeers. I'm a research fellow at the Klingendal Institute in the Netherlands, and I have the honor of being the moderator of today's event. So today we will be discussing Serbia's EU accession process. Um, we will have a look at what, what, what has been achieved so far, but we also take a critical look at what could be improved. And lastly, we'll discuss if and how the country's EU path can gain some new momentum in 2021 and beyond. Um, I feel there's an incredible lot to discuss, and for that, we could not have had a better lineup of speakers. Um, I would first like to extend a very warm welcome to Her Excellency Ms. Jadranka Joksimovic, Minister of European Integration of the Republic of Serbia. Um, we're very glad to have you here today, so a warm welcome to you. Um, also, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to Mr. Oliver Farheli, European Commissioner for Neighborhood and Enlargement. Thank you very much, Mr. Farheli, for finding the time to join us today. It's an honor to have you at our discussion. Um, I would furthermore like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers in the panel. Uh, Ms. Lise Grégoire, EU Director at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, welcome to you. Uh, Ms. Milena Lazarevic, Program Director at the European Policy Center, CEP in Belgrade, uh, welcome to you as well. And last but not least, Mr. Christoph Schmidt, who is a Brussels correspondent at the Trau newspaper here in the Netherlands. Welcome to you as well, and thank you all for joining our event. So this webinar is broadcasted live via Zoom and via YouTube, and would like to welcome all participants uh, on those platforms. Thank you for your interest in our event. Um, for those of you, of you who have joined via Zoom, um, if you have any questions or comments for us to focus on in the debate, um, please type them in the Q&A section of Zoom. And please also note to which speaker you would like to address your question. Um, we will try to come back to your comments and questions as much as possible during this event. Um, before we move to our keynote speakers, I would first like to give the floor to a speaker who I have not yet introduced. That's Mr. Tom de Bruyne, uh, president of the supervisory board of the Klingdao Institute. Um, Mr. Tom de Bruyne served amongst many other things as Dutch permanent representative to the EU. And in that capacity, he dealt with, among others, the topic of EU enlargement extensively. So Tom, a very warm welcome to you as well and over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Wouter. Uh, distinguished minister, commissioner, speakers on the panel and all other participants on Zoom and on YouTube. As president of the supervisory board of the Klingendal Institute, it's an honor and a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this high level webinar on EU-Serbia relations. Especially in this time of crisis in which traveling is hardly possible, we at the Klingendal Institute find it very important to organize conversations like this one today. And when it comes to Serbia-EU relations, the COVID crisis had made, has made clear once again that Serbia and the EU face many common challenges, but also that there are many opportunities for cooperation. This is the reason why Klingendal, over the past years has expanded its work on the relations between the EU and the Western Balkans. We are proud to have organized many expert meetings and public seminars on the issue, amongst which the highlights was a public event in 2018 with, with at the time Serbia's chief negotiator Ms. Tanja Mizevic. At the same time, Klingendal has in the past years forged relations with think tanks in the Western Balkans through its so-called Balkans hub, welcoming researchers from the region for visiting fellowships, 
at Klingendal Institute has greatly contributed to our understanding of the region, in particular Serbia. And we find it uh, important because only through intense contact on both societal and political levels, with open conversations and real interaction, Serbia and the EU can move closer together. This webinar therefore comes at an important moment. 2020 proved a difficult year for the accession process of Serbia. No new negotiating chapters were opened. And just last week, the European Parliament adopted a resolution that welcomes Serbia's formal commitment to EU accession, but also highlights concerns on a lack of pro progress in the fields of democratization and the rule of law, the absence of a chief negotiator since 2019, and recent verbal attacks by members of the Serbian parliament to research journalists. And at the end of 2020, over 70 civil organizations published a statement voicing their concern over the slow pace of democratic reforms. On the EU side, the commission has presented a new accession methodology, a COVID relief package and a longer term economic investment plan for the Western Balkans. At the same time, the EU remained distracted by internal disputes over its budget and the rule of law, as well as COVID-19 crisis management. Also societal and political interest in the enlargement remained low in several member states, raising doubts about their true commitment to the EU perspective of, amongst others, Serbia. All in all, the European perspective that was promised numerous times to the region seems not within reach at this very moment. The revised EU enlargement methodology adopted in spring last year may play a role in the revitalization of negotiations. In Brussels, the member states and the commission are currently considering how to apply the revised methodology to the negotiations with Serbia. It will be very interesting to hear from the speakers today how they see this development. Could it spur new momentum in the relations and if so, under what conditions? I'm looking forward to an open discussion this afternoon on the next steps in the EU Serbia relations. Thank you. Have a good afternoon. And Walter, back to you. Thank you, Tom, for this. Thank you, Tom, for these inspiring words. Um, let us move right away to the keynote speakers of today. I would first like to give the floor to Commissioner Farhelyi and then right away thereafter to Minister Yoksimovic. And thereafter, we will have the opportunity for a short Q&A with the keynote speakers before we move to the panel discussion. Mr. Farhelyi, you have been the commissioner for EU enlargement uh, since 2019. Um, and of course, in that capacity, dealt extensively with the EU accession process of Serbia. How would you assess the progress made when it comes to the accession negotiations with Serbia since you took office? Please, Commissioner, the floor is yours. Dear uh, participants, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to address the conference today and also to talk about Serbia's EU accession. You are posing a key question, what we can do to regain momentum in the, in the in EU enlargement process on Serbia's road to the EU membership. It is exactly with this question in mind that I have uh, proposed the revision of the enlargement methodology just last year. The new methodology is primarily destined to Albania and North Macedonia, and I hope that both of them will start negotiations soon. 
At the same time, Serbia and Montenegro have also confirmed their readiness to accept the revised methodology. I think this is a very important and very positive step from both of these countries and a major political commitment on their side. Two weeks ago, we have uh, presented to member states a way forward on how the revised accession uh, methodology can be applied to Serbia and Montenegro. Our proposal is structured along the same four principles of the revised methodology that you all know by now. First, credibility. We need to better equip the enlargement process to deal with structural weaknesses in the countries, in particular in the area of fundamentals. This also applies to Serbia and Montenegro, where we will maintain and further strengthen the existing strong focus on fundamental reforms. Second, stronger political steer. Providing the accession process with a stronger political steer can only significantly contribute to the process from both Montenegro and Serbia, in particular at the level of intergovernmental conferences. Third, dynamism. Maybe this is the most important element when we talk about Serbia. A core element of the revised methodology is that in order to inject more dynamism in the negotiations, we can work on chapters, but can also be organized around clusters. The opening of chapters by clusters is particularly relevant for Serbia, where only chapters related to the fundamentals cluster have been all opened so far. And lastly, predictability. The EU needs to bring more predictability to the process by being clear on what it expects from the candidate countries and to ensure that if they deliver, the EU also delivers. I believe that based on the revised methodology, we can have an opportunity to significantly accelerate Serbia's accession this year. Of course, this can only be achieved on the basis of solid EU-related reforms by Serbia, so by solid performance on bringing forward the reforms. The government in Belgrade made a strong commitment to these reforms when taking office last autumn, and we must use this momentum. I do hope that uh, you will hear this confirmed by Minister Joksimovic, uh, who I think will also talk about the most important elements that are related to the rule of law reform priorities of this government. Let me highlight a few developments uh, which are of particular importance to us when we are preparing uh, to open uh, clusters with Serbia. The Serbian parliament officially kicked off the second phase of the inter-party dialogue, which is led by the European parliament. We believe that this is a crucial forum for a necessary dialogue between the government and the opposition on all EU-related reforms. The government also relaunched the constitutional reform by submitting the initiative to change the constitution in the area of judiciary, and this is discussed in the parliament as we speak. It is now for the Serbian parliament to determine the next steps and present a draft text of amendments. We encourage the parliament to use the October 2018 draft as the starting point, as it, was as it has received already a green light, as you know, from the Venice Commission. On media freedom, we welcome that the government adopted an action plan for the new media strategy. And also, it has set up a working group and uh, working groups to monitor the, its implementation, as well as an SOS hotline for reporting attacks, insults, and threats against journalists. Of course, more still needs to be done. It is essential and in its, Serbia's own interest that it keeps delivering on its reform commitments. Thus, our priority now is to work with Serbia to help it translate these steps into tangible progress on the ground. It is also crucial that Serbia and Kosovo use the current window of opportunity to make progress in the dialogue, which is of key importance for the European aspirations of both. 
The process needs to continue now that a new government is in place in Kosovo. And I do hope that the new government in Kosovo will make it a priority. On the economy, Serbia has made progress with a number of important structural reforms over the past years. This is paying off. The business environment has improved. Investments are on the rise and unemployment is reaching a record low. Serbia's economy showed resilience in the COVID-19 pandemic. Its economy contracted last year only as few moderate EU member states could achieve. But further reforms are needed. While the businesses, while the business in, um, environment has improved, it is, it is still hampered by structural issues. More efforts should be invested into making the administration, of course, more efficient, improving the predictability in the implementation of legislation, and increasing the transparency of public investments. Businesses would greatly benefit from an improved situation with regard to corruption and exercise of the rule of law. Further reducing the size of the grey economy would significantly improve the investors' climate also in Serbia. As it stands now, it poses a challenge in terms of unfair competition by unregistered companies. Further efforts are also needed to improve the transparency, assessment and prioritization of public investments. It is crucial that Serbia delivers on these and other reform priorities. Bringing Serbia and the region into the EU is in our own, and not only uh, ours, but in the region's interest, because the political and economic logic that underpins the European Union applies equally to the Western Balkans. The COVID-19 pandemic has demonstrated to what extent we are interconnected. The pandemic has caused a lot of suffering across the world and also in Serbia. The EU has been standing with Serbia since the beginning and will continue to do so. This is why last spring we immediately provided emergency assistance and the 3.3 billion euros package to the Western Balkans and we are now working hard on providing vaccines to the entire region as soon as possible. It is clear that the vaccines will help us to get out of the crisis. Serbia is conducting one of the world's fastest vaccination campaigns and is rightfully proud of it. The EU has supported the campaign with the hiring of additional health personnel and by purchasing equipment requested by Serbia. In parallel, we continue to provide support for the socio-economic recovery of Serbia and the entire region. Crucial instrument in doing so is the economic and investment plan, which we have adopted and put forward for the region only last autumn. It puts priority with the governments of the region that we have discussed before coming forward with the proposal. And I would also encourage, of course, Serbia and the region to make the best use of this package of 28 billion euros of funding that we have set aside for them. The EU has never before put so much money into investments in transport and energy infrastructure, the green and digital transition and private sector development as this commission did. As part of the economic and investment plan, we're also looking at ways to integrate more and more closely the Western Balkans into the EU single market, even before accession. Where possible, we would like to see Western Balkans participate in EU policies even before former accession. In addition, we are supporting and encouraging the region to continue building a common regional market. A market of 18 million people based on EU rules would make a difference and it would be a game changer. This will help to bring European companies looking for investments and nearshoring possibilities to the Western Balkans. And overall, it will accelerate the convergence and the accession process itself. Boosting the growth potential for local businesses and improve the lives of citizens, and especially the youth, is our common aim. We can only gain momentum on Serbia's road to EU membership 
if we deliver together. We are working hard to offer support and speed up accession process, and Serbia needs to deliver on its reform priorities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Commissioner Fahiri, for your very comprehensive insights. Um, you touched upon many elements in the process, and I also already saw a question popping up in the Q&A section. But before we move to a short Q&A, I would like to right away give the floor to Minister uh, Joksimovic, uh, uh, Minister for European Integration of the Republic of Serbia. Uh, uh, dear Minister, thank you very much for being here. You have been dealing with Serbia's EU accession path in your career from various positions, among which from 2014, Minister without portfolio in charge of European integration, and from 2017, Minister for European Integration. Could you enlighten us with your impressions of the state of affairs of Serbia's EU accession process, uh, as well as the prospects for the future? Thank you, Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank to all participants, uh, especially to you, Mr. Tsvers, but uh, as well to Commissioner Varhey and uh, to uh, Mr. De Bruyne and all other participants. And um, sincere thanks and my real appreciations of the opportunity for discussing the relevant matters in the Serbia's EU accession process offered by Kligendale Institute, known as a great environment, which means uh, the online one as well, of independent thinking and innovative research and teaching on international relations and diplomacy. Uh, I think that a lot of things has been mentioned already by Commissioner, by, by Mr. De Bruyne uh, as well, but uh, I would just like to give you a couple of very important uh, facts and very important uh, maybe topics for further discussion and uh, Q&A which you have announced already. Uh, first of all, when we speak about Serbia's succession process, sometimes even in Serbia, but I can notice that all around Europe, uh, even among old member states, that sometimes we hear about association process. Serbia has become associated member when SAA agreement uh, was put in a force uh, in 2013. So we are accession country or acceding country. Uh, and sometimes we have a lot of terms that we are using and that they are circulating among um, uh, region, uh, EU member states, etc. And we never discuss the real meaning. On the other hand, I have heard that chief negotiator, for example, for years were, was a uh, is Tanya Miščević. Chief negotiator was from the very beginning, I was the chief negotiator, because there is a difference in Serbian uh, old uh, and, and new one uh, law about the chief of negotiation team, which was very important during the screening process and technocratic issues, and the chief negotiator was always a member of government, being a minister for EU integration, and today I'm still a chief negotiator, as I was six years ago when I took my first position. When it comes to the accession process as someone who has led this process from the very beginning in 2014, I can tell you that I was in a way uh, uh, witnessing, I was witnessing the change of atmosphere and the change of interpretation of the uh, meaning and the role of the enlargement politics from the one being always interpreted as one of the most successful one uh, in European Union to something that was uh, already, you know, and, and that become uh, already very, I would say, not very popular uh, joint uh, European politics. However, uh, the title you have offered to me and to all of us today, Serbia on a wobbly road to a EU membership, it's quite okay with me. Uh, if, if we are not in a wobbly bobbly game and that we uh, suddenly only Don became very angry, not you or not, not us being a candidate country. So wobbly pet is quite, quite all right. And it is, it is really wobbly. Uh, when it comes to the new methodology, I would like to tell you something which uh, you will also never hear very often uh, among the European circles. Actually, Serbia and our president and prime minister, we have accepted new methodology uh, in, uh, I think it was July or August last year without knowing at all how it will look like, what would be the content, and how it will be applied to already acceding countries. That means that we have shown significant, uh, I would say, level and, uh, and a strong uh, confidence in the good 
intentions and the good manners from European Union when it comes to the enlargement and when it comes to uh, all, let's say, candidate and potential candidates from the Western Balkan, but also when it comes to Serbia. So we were very keen to accept that. To be honest, I was very cautious, not because of the possible content, but because of what happened lately and what, what was in a way proving that I was right to be cautious, because we were in some kind of interregnum and almost limbo between between the existing methodology about the chapters and all other things with the existing uh, methodology that we were using and waiting for uh, member states and commission to agree on a uh, new methodology enhanced approach to the Western Balkan and cred more credible accession process and uh, to uh, at the end of the day to uh, also uh, define a roadmap or some kind of a roadmap for application for those countries including Serbia who have have been already um, exceeding countries deeply in the ne negotiation process. But however, I think that our decision was right, that we were uh, absolutely, I think, uh, uh, right to accept new methodology and to show confidence in the good intentions of European Union to really make this process, which became in one moment sclerotic bureaucratic process, and turn into a more credible, politically guided and um, uh, politically steered process, both from European Union and from candidate countries or acceding countries. And I, uh, I think that uh, last couple of uh, weeks we have been, or actually last couple of months, I personally and my team, we were in very dynamic and uh, really on daily basis contact with the European Commission and of course with other member states discussing how it will be um, applied. Uh, we have also sent some of our suggestions. Of course, I was aware that uh, it, it won't be everything acceptable that uh, we have uh, seen as the best way how to apply new methodology but generally it was important for us to have a very intensive dialogue about the way how it will be applied. When it comes to the clusters, I think that is something which offers to us to have uh, maybe, how to say, um, a more dynamic approach uh, in the, in the uh, opening of several chapters from the same cluster, which will be, I think, a flexible way to improve and to speed up the process. But of course, as you already noticed, uh, we are completely aware that the rule of law area and the basics and fundamentals from the cluster one, by the way, we have opened all five out of five chapters in this cluster already. So that, that would be the main instrument for the, how to say, imbalance clause and corrective measures. When I say corrective measures, I want to be quite clear about that. Serbian existing negotiation framework predicts only for Serbia, not even to Montenegro, but only for Serbia, very strict, very stringent criteria for imbalance clauses when it comes to the uh, chapters 23, 24, or let's say rule of law chapters today, cluster one, fundamentals, um, then also for the normalization of the dialogue between Belgrade and uh, for, uh, throughout the dialogue, uh, Belgrade, Pristina, um, reconciliation, uh, regional, uh, regional cooperation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So all chapters that we have already opened, 18 out of 35, according to all the methodology, it was not impossible to open a single chapter if we haven't had uh, a good assessment on the progress on the rule of law in the area of rule of law. So these criteria have been already very strict and stringent for Serbia. That's why we insisted that, and by the way, that was a gentleman agreement that we will not change the existing negotiation framework for, the, for, for Serbia. Still, I think that it is very important to mention that our part of imbalance clauses was also something that no other country has, and it is a highly political issue for us, very sensitive and very difficult for us, which is a normalization. And I saw already one question being uh, uh, you know, asked uh, for the normalization of Belgrade uh, and Pristina relations throughout the dialogue facilitated by the EU. So just want to say that it's not something completely new for us, but now we understand that it is additionally underlined and that uh, additional uh, attention will be paid to the uh, rule of law area 
uh, freedom of media, uh, uh, prevention on corruption, struggle against organized crime, ju judicial reform, which is very important that Commissioner Verheyen mentioned already. And I'm very uh, open and ready to answer all potential questions about that because we are really uh, introducing, uh, even during this pandemic, terrible pandemic challenges to the old to call the world, I think, and the, to the whole of Europe, I think that uh, we haven't forgot that we haven't forgotten our uh, responsibilities when it comes to the reform process. And I can credibly confirm to you that a lot of things has been uh, already done in the different area uh, of the of, of the rule of uh, rule of law, let's say cluster. So uh, when it comes to the future steps, uh, also Commissioner mentioned, uh, according to the new methodology, new format for the IGC, uh, let's say intergovernmental uh, conferences. Uh, and I think this is the best way how to uh, find a proper place for a strategic political high level dialogue which will offer to EU and the member states, which I think that now nowadays, according to the new methodology, will have more influence and more insight in the accession uh, uh, process. And uh, that would be a proper way and proper place at a high level discussion of uh, about the expectations, clear expectations from EU member states uh, to Serbia as a succeeding country. On the other hand, for us to uh, really to uh, very, uh, I would say openly and frankly, talk about our position on different issues, uh, about a lot of challenges that we are facing as well, and to see how we can continue our uh, EU accession process more, more efficiently. So looking forward to organize um, uh, hopefully till the end of the Portuguese presidency, uh, to have this high level IGC. And I think um, it would be good to open a cluster, some of the cluster, we are already preparing a different uh, benchmarks for clusters three, which is a competitiveness and inclusive growth and for cluster four, which is a green deal digitalization and uh, uh, transport infrastructural interconnectivity, but just one word more. Uh, and I hope that during this IGC, we can, no matter if we open the clusters or not, that we have to actively um, I think, uh, understand each other and actively engaged in the accept acceptance of the new methodology and how it will be applied in the further process. But uh, however, uh, I can assure you that Serbia stay committed to European uh, integration as our not only prime or priority as our uh, strategic uh, foreign policy goal, but as a part of our domestic development agenda, as uh, you mentioned already, economic investment plan offering a lot of uh, different financial sources, mostly from national IPA, but also pre-accession fund, but also from the Western Balkan investment framework as well for a regional project that really can bring new impulse, impulses for the new growth and for the smooth transition to what is the most important thing these days, and that is a, a Green Deal, digitalization and interconnectivity. But we don't forget that the rule of law is the most important. Don't worry about that. And I'm very ready to answer all your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Yakshimovic, for clarifying the position of the Serbian government. And thank you also for clarifying the issue of the uh, chief negotiator. Um, uh, um, of course, uh, we will now have time for a, a number of questions. Um, um, I will have a look at the Q&A section, but I would also like to give the panelists the opportunity to pose a question to our keynote speakers. Um, I hope the commissioner is also still with us. Um, uh, could I ask the speakers in the panel, uh, um, who would like to pose a question? Um, Um, if there's no question from, from the panel at this point, then I will first um, um, uh, pose a question myself. Um, um, Ms. Yoksimovic, um, you, you, in your introductory remarks and your keynote uh, statements, you touched upon the length and the, and the depth of the, of the accession process. Uh, and um, 
often as think tankers, we often criticize uh, the EU for the accession process for its slow pace. Uh, um, also, maybe that uh, conditionality during the pro process has become increasingly demanding. And as we all know, uh, the European Council already signaled the EU membership perspective to, to, to the region all the way back in 2003. So my own impression is that the longer and more complicated the process becomes, there is also some more disillusionment uh, among, among Serbian citizens. Uh, uh, would you agree that the length of the process in itself has become a problem? And uh, if so, what could the EU do to counter this potential disillusionment? Um, yes, please, uh, Minister. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you for the question. And it needs uh, to be uh, clarified uh, why this Euroscepticism has shown uh, its face not only to Serbia, but generally to the region. But when it comes to Serbia, I think it's very important to understand that after the 2000, the year of 2000, and after the so called democratic changes in Serbia being uh, in power, uh, pro European, declaratively pro European parties, you know, they offered to people a lot of false experiences expectations. You know, in Serbia, there was in one moment uh, in 2003, for example, that we will become a, promises that we will become a member state in 2007. So then we will have, a, we will be a full member in 2000. Uh, nine and then in 2011. So you can imagine what kind of. Uh, and by the way, we have uh, we have uh, you know signed the uh, SAA agreement. Uh, let's say in 2009, and uh, then you know you can imagine what kind of uh, false expectations and misguidelines uh, misguidelines uh, were offered by some of very so-called pro-European parties here in Serbia. And of course, uh, then uh, European Union faced with a new Commerce uh, and the new uh, member states, uh, which became, and if I understood quite well, all my partners from European Union for the last six years, not being very functional and in full preparation for the full membership, meaning the relatively new EU member states, which means then on the both side, from EU and from Serbia, there was some kind of, uh, I would say, mis misperceptions about, uh, about uh, uh, how to say, um, uh, on one hand, what do you expect from a future uh, member state? On the other hand, for all those uh, false expectations from the Serbian citizens that were in a way, you know, um, uh, that, that led to the uh, more Euroscepticism uh, among the Serbian people. Not, but I don't want to uh, avoid to tell you something which is actually the only truth about the European, uh, I would say, Euroscepticism here in Serbia. Very difficult topic for our citizens is a uh, uh, normalization uh, uh, let's say, process with the Belgrade and Pristina throughout the uh, mediation, mediation role and facilitated by European Union. So many of people uh, in Serbia directly link, uh, make uh, in their minds link with the necessity to recognize or uh, independent Kosovo, which is not our position and that we don't clearly don't want without uh, uh, meaningful dialogue and meaningful agreements and meaningful uh, compromises. On the other hand, uh, some of uh, very, I would say, loud and very clear member states, they expect and they very often, uh, very uh, loudly say that they expect Serbia to recognize the independent Kosovo, which certainly don't uh, support more pro-European orientation of Serbian citizens. Yeah. To be very clear on that, uh, because this is something highly political, uh, um, let's say, reason, and we are facing on daily basis with this kind of stories but yeah. generally i can assure you that the, and i will uh, end with this uh, with this sentence generally for the last couple of years in row let's say for last four or five years in row we have a high level percentage of people supporting eu membership so it's always uh, uh, above 48 percent of people meaning that if tomorrow is referendum and that Serbian people should say yes or no to membership, to the membership of European Union, uh, uh, above 50%, it's from 50 to 55, sometimes it's, you know, it, it has ups and downs, but we'll say yes 
to, to membership European right. Union. So well, my question you. is, what would your what would your citizens say uh, when it comes to the ratification of the possible membership agreement? That's a very good question, and I actually wouldn't know that data, so I will not uh, uh, touch on that for now. Um, I think there's a question uh, from Ms. Lazarevich from the European Policy Center in Belgrade to Commissioner Farheli. Ms. Lazarevich, please. Thank you. Thank you, Wouter. Uh, and actually, my question uh, probably builds on the very ending of uh, Minister Yoksimovic's um, answer to your question, Wouter. Um, I wanted. To, I would like to ask um, Commissioner Vareli, um, what what do you uh, see as the most important, um, um, let's say, approach or the most important action to take in order to persuade the European Union member states citizens uh, that the accession of um, uh, Serbia and the rest of the Western Balkans to the EU is indeed um, beneficial not only for the region but also for the EU uh, itself. Is it, in your opinion, mainly about uh, better communication? Communication of what is already being done? Do we need um, a change of the image of the Western Balkan countries? Uh, or uh, is it more about the actual lack of uh, substantive uh, progress or substantive improvement in the Western Balkan countries uh, that the citizens of Western European, especially Western European uh, member states uh, can see and feel. So we know that uh, uh, support to EU, uh, uh, to EU enlargement was not uh, particularly high also even in the case of uh, the Central and Eastern European uh, countries. Uh, it was usually uh, in some uh, Western uh, EU member states um, uh, even below 50% at that time, but still it was higher than it is nowadays in case of the Balkans. So what, what is there to be done? Is it more about communication of what is already being done or do we actually need to show more progress and more and persuade the EU citizens that the Balkans are the good guys? Thanks. Commissioner, please. And, and just, I'm looking at the clock, so let's try to, to to um, um, uh, also move towards the panel in a couple of minutes. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, I will, I will, I will try to keep it short, although this is a, an academic question, I would say, uh, but this is the core of the, of, the, uh, of the issue I had to deal with when uh, when took over from the previous commission. How uh, to uh, make the whole process more credible. So if you look at the four principles of the, of the renewed methodology, you will find the answers. These, these four principles are the answers. And in that, of course, um, it's not only that the Western Balkans uh, um, needs convincing uh, that its future is in the European Union, but also our member states need need convincing and that was the for me that was the biggest challenge uh, when i took over and in doing so um, there are two main areas or, or maybe three uh, and communication is, is only one element of it communication is uh, is the vehicle through which we can improve uh, uh, the possibilities but first of all we have seen um, that in some of the member states the public itself uh, has questions uh, about the usefulness of uh, welcoming the Western Balkans in the European Union. To, to make it absolutely blunt, um, I mean, we are in, after all, we are hosted by the Dutch, so we can yes. go blunt. <laughs> uh, so uh, we need to, to gain their trust, and their trust can only be gained through progress on the ground meaning cracking down on organized crime, meaning improving governance, meaning uh, improving the predictability of the whole process. So that this is not just some administrative processes uh, run by people who are not uh, liable or responsible to anybody, but at some point they will say, oh, well, everything is done. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to say yes. This is not how it is going to work. And, and this is what we have to understand, I think. And then that, that was a, it's a sobering moment, I know. It was a sobering moment uh, for the Western Balkans and it is a sobering moment also for our member states. But I'm glad that uh, we have passed that sobering moment. And the answer is in the new methodology. The second is, um, how should I put it in a, in a, in a very simple way, uh, how I have put it to myself? 
is that, of course, uh, you rebuild trust with your neighbors because the Western Balkans is our neighbor, the closest actually, we are surrounding it, I mean, the European Union is surrounding it, is by actually um, making sure that the lives we're living are not only comparable, but um, are becoming um, the least different from one another, meaning in our economic and uh, social realities that we are uh, getting closer and closer uh, through the enlargement process. To give you an example, um, to raise the trust of our companies that it's not only safe, but it is also worthwhile uh, to invest in the Western Balkans is one of the key factors through which we can convince also the public of, of the member states, including the more skeptic ones. Because if they go home and they say that they have a good business environment, uh, they have comparable uh, um, possibilities of accessing markets uh, as they have in Europe, they have good workforce uh, in these regions through which, uh, with whom they can work and that it is after all a successful investment uh, for them, this will bring back good news also uh, for their own uh, member states. And these are the good news we need. And also if we can, if we can demonstrate uh, to the public at large that given the fact that there's a catching up in the economic development of the region, with the European Union, and therefore there is no disparity that could trigger uh, uh, difficulties we have seen with the previous enlargement, the, 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 the last two enlargements, uh, then there would be uh, more ease on the side of the of the public of the member states. So thank you, Mr. And the Commissioner. Third would be the, the third would be, the, of course, the, the communication. But you know, first we have to deliver on the ground. Thank you very much, Mr. Commissioner. And uh, looking at the clock, I would like to turn uh, uh, right away to uh, our panelists uh, who have been patiently waiting so far. Uh, um, Ms. Lise Gregoire, EU Director at the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, the member states have already been touched upon a number of times in our conversation so far. And the Netherlands is of course seen as a rather, well, critical member state when it comes to EU enlargement. Um, um, could you maybe provide us with some nuance regarding that Dutch position towards your enlargement in general and the relation with Serbia specifically? Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, to this uh, important discussion. And uh, um, it's un unfortunately we we can't meet in person, but uh, I'm happy we can have this discussion online. Uh, and I think it's a very timely discussion because we have seen uh, some very positive developments, like uh, the commissioner and and Minister Jok Simovic has been highlighting. Uh, and, um, but there are uh, some, some concerns that remain and I, I will touch upon that uh, later. First of all, and I know that the Serbian uh, embassy was also part of the organization of this, uh, this meeting. So, uh, and I want to highlight the strong bilateral ties that we have between Serbia uh, and the Netherlands. And um, if you look closely, you see that the, the Dutch trade is increasing uh, and now up to like 1 billion euros a, a year. Um, and the Netherlands is the, lar the largest source of uh, foreign investments in Serbia at this moment. And you see Dutch companies present in, in almost every sector in, the, in, the, in Serbia. And I think that is a very uh, important sign of our engagement. Um, and furthermore, of course, and we've been talking about this, Serbia is a candidate country, and that is, means that our relationship is, is special. Um, our minister, Bloch, he's visited Serbia in 2019. Uh, we had uh, bilateral consultations a few months ago, and our prime minister spoke uh, on the phone recently. And, and of course, our, your, your ambassador is a, is a well-seen guest in our ministry. Um, so I think the, the relationship in general is, is friendly and important to both. And I want to stress that uh, at, uh, at the outset. Um, so I'd like to zoom in on the accession process. And, and first of all, um, I'd like to, to highlight um, that, that we want to reaffirm um, the EU perspective for the Western Balkans. And that is real for us. And um, we, we support, the Netherlands support the future EU accession um, of uh, Serbia. And uh, that commitment is steadfast. Um, 
And for us, being a member or as an aspiring member of the EU means um, a membership of a family of values. And I think, and you, uh, you said, Wouter, at your introduction that we might be critical for enlargement. I think we are mainly critical when it comes to rule of law and, and it plays out also in the domain of accession. So you, it means being part of a family of values, of the rule of law, of governance, of laws and reg regulations. And this is not an abstract thing. Um, we have to be very explicit what the rule of law means in the EU and what we expect from one another and hold each other to account. And uh, we have learned this over time, that this is the concept of the rule of law uh, is not the same for everyone. And what, what is expected of every, everyone has to be clarified. And I was happy also that the commissioner uh, underlined the fact that we needed to clarify that. And he also underlined the element of trust because only through a functioning rule of law within the European Union, we can have the mutual trust to make the EU cooperation work. So it's mainly from that perspective that we also look at enlargement. So when only when democracy and rule, and rule of law are truly rooted, a country can prosper and uh, thrive within the European Union. And any erosion of the rule of law jeopardizes the legal, political and economic foundations of the Union. And as we're our economy and our, like every system is so intertwined with the European Union, for us, this is, is it's a key element. It's like the foundation. We have to get the foundation right in order for the rest uh, to work. So it's important not only for it, like as a theme as such, but also like when it comes to the functioning of the internal market, to climate policy, uh, the Schengen uh, cooperation and so on. Uh, but also, so this requires not only attention when it comes to the accession process, but also within the European border, it, required, it requires vigilance. Um, only last week, for example, a delegation of the Commission visited the Netherlands. It was a virtual visit <laughs> to prepare the, the Dutch um, country chapter in the annual uh, rule of law report, which me measures um, member states, um, the rule of law standards and how it's applied. Um, and we see this participation in this exercise as a, as a sign of strength and not of weakness. For us, it's not important. I mean, I think every country struggles and it, rule of law issues are, are very, can be very difficult to tackle. And so we know all about that. Uh, so nobody is immune to that, uh, but it's important what you do with the recommendations and how you apply that. Um, so on the methodology, it has been mentioned and um, the accession process, uh, first and foremost, is a, is a process of rule of law reforms. Um, and the progress in the reforms determines the speed uh, of the enlargement process. It's, it's not a pre predetermined timeline. Uh, and these reforms are demanding and challenging, and we know that, uh, but we insist on these for a good reason. We aim uh, for enlargement to strengthen the EU, uh, and enlargement should be win-win, uh, both benefiting the candidate country, but also the EU as a whole. We need to get out be stronger together. Uh, so it's crucial for us to get that the fundamentals right. And for these reasons, we were very pleased with the new methodology that uh, Commissioner uh, Varheli um, uh, presented last year. And it ensures even stronger focus on those fun fundamentals, including the rule of law and economic reforms. And it also clearly increases the coherence between the rule of law, investment and public procurement, for example. Uh, and this will lead to more connectivity and will enhance uh, the, um, uh, the investment climate. And furthermore, through the new methodology, clear options for speeding up the process or slowing it down are presented, depending on the commitment to reforms by the candidate member states. And, and I listened very clear, car uh, carefully to what uh, Minister Yoksomovich said about the speed of the process. And I think that the new methodology actually offers an opportunity uh, for countries to speed it up. Uh, but it depends very much on the, the investment that the candidates show. Um, so we are very pleased that both Serbia and Montenegro have clearly accepted this methodology uh, and stated that it would be applied to their negotiations. And of course, at this moment, we're still discussing how that will work in practice, as many chapters have been opened and the rules of the games uh, were, of course, set uh, years ago. But since the candidates have accepted in principle the new methodology, 
we're confident that we will work this out shortly. After all, with a stronger focus on the fundamentals, the accession process will be more focused and could also go quicker, and that would be in everyone's interest. About the Netherlands position, and many of you mentioned that uh, our position before, uh, we, we come across as, uh, as very strict when we speak a lot about conditions, um, and uh, particularly when it relates to rule of law, like I just did uh, before. Uh, and yes, we are strict, uh, but also fair and engaged uh, towards candidate countries. Uh, we stand for a merit-based process and want conditions to be fully met. And as my minister stated several times in parliament, when they are met, we deliver. Uh, we're not only strict, but also very engaged. And our embassies in the region are, are very active through numerous bilateral pro projects and initiatives. And furthermore, there has been a strong EU support to the Western Balkans during the current pandemic. And Commissioner Valheli, he mentioned it, and he proved to be a very strong advocate for this support that included a support package of 3.3 billion euros for the region, and uh, including like 93.4 million for Serbia alone and the lifting of export restrictions uh, for PPE. Um, so we agree with the keynote speakers that there have been uh, promising steps in the reform process in the, in the past few months in Serbia. At the same time, we hope to see more rapid and sustainable reforms, especially in the fundamentals cluster, which is crucial for the negotiations. And in the Ms. area Kibar, of human- Could I ask you to round up your contribution? I am Thank rounding you. up. Thank Great. you, yeah. Um, and in the area of human rights, for example, in the fight against corruption and media freedom, um, the progress report was very clear on these issues. And furthermore, we need to see adequate operating space for those respective agencies, not only on paper, but especially in words and deeds. And the proof of the pudding is in the eating. A good track record is essential. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Grégoire, for, for clarifying also the Dutch position in, in all of this. I'd like to turn right away to uh, Milena Lazarevic from the European Policy Center in Belgrade. Uh, uh, Ms. Lazarevic, so many things have already been touched upon, but I'm sure you have some comments on some of the things that have been said already. So over to you. Thank you, Wouter. Um... Uh, speaking as a representative of the Serbian civil society at events uh, such as this one, I always, I'm always presented with a dilemma. How do I, on the one hand, help persuade the EU, its member states and its institutions alike, that they need to accept and facilitate our accession to the Union, but at the same time, they need to be very open and outspoken about the problems and deficiencies, uh, especially the ones in the fundamental reform areas, uh, the rule of law and state of democracy in particular. So how do I advocate for my country's EU membership, which is very deep in my heart and my mind, while recognizing and being candid about the fact that uh, the actions of the incumbent government might not necessarily be taking us down that road? Uh, back at home, we in the civil society get even portrayed as traitors and enemies when we criticize the government. Uh, lately, we're openly being labeled as political opposition even when we do so. Uh, what is often targeted is our credibility, our competencies, our legitimacy, although we base our criticism on data and research. So just to give you an example, uh, our last year's research uh, done on a representative sample of Serbian citizens um, showed that two thirds of them think that employment into the public administration is based on political and personal connections rather than competencies and merit. Yet the government continues to appoint political loyalists into the highest civil service positions, directors, assistant ministers, whose competencies are decisive for the quality and continuity of the complex reform processes. As much as 94% of these positions were in 2019 filled through political process, the so-called acting positions, and in open breach of the actual national legislation in many cases. So this is hard data, and these are facts, and this is what gives us legitimacy and what proves our credibility. We cannot just shove these problems under the carpet. Uh, and I think that we can only do good for our society and our children. Uh, and uh, I'm one of those parents that really wants my children to stay in Serbia and to live in a successful and, uh, uh, um, and uh, um, developed country. Uh, so we can only do good to our society if we create and exert pressure on our government to address these problems and to stop from such damaging actions. Uh, we need to create both internal pressures within our country from the civil society, from the citizens, but also external pressure from the international actors with leverage over the government, such as the EU and its member states. 
So I want my country to join the EU and I'm probably one of the greatest uh, EU enthusiasts you will find in Serbia. I studied the EU uh, and its system since 2000. Uh, since 2005, I've been working on Serbia's EU accession, uh, first within the government as a civil servant and then in the think tank community. Uh, and, but I'm, not, I'm also not delusional. I know the realities of the enlargement policy and I know what consequences the negative experiences from the previous enlargement have also created. Um, the EU and its institutions, and especially the older member states, are now afraid of letting in more unfinished democracies. And also they have learned the lesson that a democracy is not created and consolidated in 10 years. And that the pre-accession period is probably the best time to ensure that proper democratic and rule of law standards are built and embedded in a system. So this is why they insist on those reforms. But this is also why we insist on those reforms, not only because of the EU, but also because strong democracy is in our own interest, in the interest of, of every single, single Serbian citizen. So where can we go from, from here? Uh, it is my belief that uh, we need a much clearer and more strategic communication from the EU. That's on the one hand, Serbia's place is in the EU. The EU is incomplete without the Balkans, but that the actions of the current government might not be right and are not properly, let's say, taking us in this direction. The lack of progress cannot and should not be blamed on the Serbian people. And I think this is very important to stress in the case of EU member states with populations uh, which are not supportive of our uh, EU membership. So these, it, it needs to be clear whose fault or whose responsibility is that the process is not advancing. Um, and although the government in Serbia, which you know many of our listeners uh, here and the attendees might think the government is elected by the people, uh, the government does borrow its legitimacy from external support too. So glorification of political leadership, uh, which has sometimes or even frequently been practiced by presidents, prime ministers and other high level officials from the EU, creates a sense here at home in Serbia that those who criticize the government actions are bigger Catholics than the Pope, that we are somehow dishonest, that we're not working in the best interest of our society. So in order to create a clear sense of responsibility for the current state of affairs and for the stagnation which we are experiencing in the process, we need the EU to be more outspoken about our belonging in its family, while at the same time being very clear on whose responsibility it is that the process is stagnating. And moreover, and I know that this might seem contradictory at first sight, but please bear with me as it is not, we need the EU to ensure that the process can indeed go much faster, that the promise of the process is much, much uh, more direct. The new methodology truly needs to deliver on supporting a much more dynamic accession process. And I was actually hoping that before the, um, uh, the methodology was, uh, was published, that, that it would actually promise even more. Um, we need to uh, the, the possibility of membership to really be just around the corner for a country that makes fast progress. And I think this is where the Netherlands can contribute and can help. Just like it was for the uh, Central and Eastern European countries, uh, and for instance, for Slovakia, which in, in early 2000s, after the mature government, as a latecomer in the process, made very quick progress and joined already in 2004. So we need the process to include real and tangible benefits for the citizens and as well as substantial investments and development aid, some of those investments which uh, uh, have been promised are already mentioned, but these investments and these, these development aid also needs to be restructured in order to increase with the progress in the process, so as to create additional stimulus uh, throughout the process. As the country moves closer, the aid and the investments should be growing. The money invested in real progress in the Western Balkans will not be wasted money for the EU's net contributors, such as the Netherlands. And numerous economic analyses have already proven that the EU has greatly benefited from its integration with the Western Balkan region, and it stands to gain much more um, as this, uh, as, as, if the region develops faster. So Thanks. for this reason, Serbia and the entire region need EU's investment and support. They need to be encompassed by all EU's policies whenever and wherever possible. Support and recognition need to be quick when progress is made and such credibility must not be put at risk. And at the same time, breaches of the democratic standards and rule of law must be openly criticized by the EU actors and proper remedies must be requested from the government. And only in such a pro credible process, only such a credible process can truly support my country to transform itself into a capable and successful EU member state, which is what we essentially want. We want not only to become EU members, but to play a constructive role within the union and to be good partners also to, uh, our, to the EU member states. Thank, Thank you very much, Ms. Lazarevic. And I surely hoped for an open conversation today, and I'm very glad you took this opportunity to make this conversation an open one, to point to some of the problems you see both 
um, within the EU approach, but also within the current course of your country. I'm sure that the minister would like to respond, but before I will give her the opportunity to do so, uh, let us first turn to Christoph Schmidt. Uh, uh, Mr. Schmidt, uh, you're a, a news correspondent uh, for the Dutch newspaper Trouw uh, in Brussels, and being there, you do not only follow the EU's or the Dutch or the Serbian perspective, but you also get impressions from 26 other member states, the parliament, etc. Um, and you also follow many other dossiers. So is, is EU enlargement as such still a, a priority for the EU? Mr. Schmidt, over, over to you. Yes, thank you very much, Walter, uh, <clears throat> for the invitation and a little explanation about my background, uh, because yes, this is the European Parliament in Strasbourg, but I'm not there, I'm at home in Brussels, and I'm also not representing in any way an European Parliament or defending its interests or whatever. It's just a nice background. That's a little disclaimer. Um, to answer your question, well, if you ask me uh, how high on the priority list is uh, enlargement at this moment in Brussels, I'm afraid, uh, well, you already know it already, that it's quite low. Uh, when you look at the big issues that keeps uh, the EU institutions busy, but not only the institutions, but also the citizens of the European countries, well, they are all well known. It's the pandemic, it's the economic recovery from the pandemic. Uh, we have a fallout of the Brexit, which is not only an economic issue, but um, uh, it's also a, was a psychological, very big blow that uh, member states left the union. So the countries are still getting uh, to grips with this uh, phenomenon uh, and they don't want to think about enlarging. Uh, we have the Green Deal, which is a big uh, theme. We have the asylum and migration discussion, which is ongoing. And many countries uh, say we first have to to finish that part before we can think about uh, enlargement. Well, you know all the subjects uh, probably. So the the Western Balkans and, uh, and specifically the accession of, of Serbia is at this moment very low on the on the priority list. And I found it striking that last week there was a meeting of the foreign affairs ministers and the Western Balkans was on their, their agenda and that was not a good sign. Because, uh, as you know, foreign affairs ministers, they talk about the big problems in the world, about Myanmar, about Venezuela, and the fact that they also included the Western Balkans in their uh, agenda was, uh, was not a good sign. I think it was some, nothing to do with Serbia, but something in Bosnia, I think, some prob problem there. Um, and when you look at the presidencies, the current previous ones, um, they also didn't put uh, Serbia very high on their on their list. Uh, last year, there was this trio presidency program of the three presidents, Germany, Portugal and Slovenia, 35 pages. There was no mentioning of, of any enlargement. Uh, when you look at the current Portuguese program of the Portuguese presidency, uh, there's an item there called Global Europe, uh, promote Europe openness to the world, no mentioning of the Western Balkans. Um, what about the next president, Slovenia? Of course, uh, that's also uh, uh, more or less a country in that region, which might be uh, interested in, uh, in getting uh, the priority uh, of the accession more up the agenda. The Minister of Foreign Affairs already announced that he was considering a new EU Western Balkan summit. Still unknown if that will take place, because we have seen uh, relatively a lot of uh, those uh, events lately. Uh, probably Charles Michel also has to agree uh, if that's a good idea. So that's still in the air. And then after Slovenia comes France, well, we all know how President Macron thinks about enlargement. Uh, some years ago, he said also that we first have to put our own house in order before we can admit new members. Also not very promising. I think uh, it's clear that, that Brussels is not very, uh, very busy with, with this subject. Um, me, myself, as a journalist, I'm, I'm very curious how this new methodology will work. Um, uh, the promise is that it's get, the process gets more political with more involvement of countries and maybe also of, of, of citizens. I don't know. Uh, we have to wait and see. Um, I think um, there's a lot of work to be done for EU leaders to, 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 to gain the trust of their own population that, uh, that uh, admission of new member states as Serbia is, is important for the safety of the whole EU. I don't think they are very good at it at this moment because they just don't talk about it. Uh, at the same time, uh, the whole region is strategically, strategically very Im high importance. Um, and it struck me that in this whole discussion so far, no one has mentioned China, uh, which is, of course, uh, a potential big player in, in the region. We saw that last year with, uh, 
uh, with the, um, the Chinese uh, sending of medical equipment to, to uh, Belgrade. Uh, and also, I remember that um, the Bulgarian uh, Prime Minister Borisov once said in, in January 2018, when his presidency started, uh, that there's a chance that people in Belgrade uh, will say, uh, look at that bridge, it was destroyed by NATO and rebuilt by China. And it's, I think it's that kind of sentiments and feelings that uh, in West, especially in Western Europe, uh, is not really felt. And in the region, it is much more important. Yeah. So okay. to finish, uh, I, I really think that, uh, that there's not a lot of public involvement in, in the whole process. Well, thank you, Mr. Schmidt, and also thank you for you for taking a very uh, frank and open uh, 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 position in this uh, in this conversation. Uh, Mr. Tom de Bruyne, all the way at the beginning of this uh, meeting, mentioned that there are some common opportunities and challenges for the EU and the and the Western Balkans, or a lot of them. And actually, I would say that some of the policy fields that you touched upon, so such as the Green Deal for example, and, the, uh, and in the extension of that the Green Agenda for the Western Balkans, do also provide some opportunities actually for cooperation and maybe for some natural, uh, for some increased engagement between the EU and the region. Um, uh, I, I see that this whole conversation has taken already a bit longer than, than we had expected. We're supposed to end in three minutes only. So actually... Um, I would like to give the floor back to Minister Joksimovic, and I would like to give you, Minister, three minutes, three minutes only to, to, to give a quick response to the panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Tvers. I think it's uh, fair enough because, as you said, you are strict but fair. So it's fair approach to give opportunity to at least to give a couple of uh, minutes for the answering. So first thing, when I heard my dear friend, Commissioner Verhey, talking about the neighborhood, I have a really problem with that because we are not part of neighborhood policy. We are part of the enlargement policy and Serbia is associated country and we are in the middle of the accession process. So I think it would be really, uh, I think it would be smart to uh, reconsider the narrative among the member states about the uh, enlargement and about the Western Balkan. By the way, I don't know where is the Eastern Balkan. I suppose it's a part of European Union already. And where is the Southern one? I also suppose it's a part of European Union already. So Balkan is a part of European Union with the biggest Balkan country, meaning Romania, meaning Bulgaria, meaning Greece. So Balkan is a part of Europe and European Union. So uh, just to reconsider a little bit the narrative. When it, com when it comes to the corrective measures that, uh, that uh, uh, Mrs. Lisa Gregory mentioned, sorry for pronunciation, maybe I haven't said correctly, but uh, I think it's really good that you have mentioned that since I think personally uh, that it is very important to discuss among member states the corrective measures for the member states. It's very easy to be very stringent and very uh, rigid when it comes to those countries ante portas. But we don't participate in the decision-making process. We are not in any way harm the decision-making process of European Union, but your member states do that. And that's why I think it would be much more fair approach to discuss about the real corrective measures among the member states and the Lisbon agreement than to be very harsh and very rigid on the, on the candidate country, which is also part of the deal. And uh, we can accept uh, you know, that we have already very, very difficult corrective measures. When it comes to those, how to say that, um, uh, uh, let, let's say, uh, voiced outcries from the Belgrade coming. Those voiced outcries uh, shows clearly the process of those privileges, various privileges over the first decade of this century uh, at the expense of the society at large, always justified uh, as needed in their struggle of democratization. It's very good and profitable way to have a project and to have programs and I fully support that. But you know, Serbia has been changed a lot and all those uh, so-called uh, calls for uh, noticing democratic backsliding and all other misnomers in order to turn 
as many eyes as possible away from the regenerated Serbia, who is economically absolutely uh, uh, sustainable, who is vaccinated at the, uh, the, the most of, uh, I would say, our population with all vaccines, offering solidarity and help for, uh, with the rest of the region. We, uh, we have shared our vaccines with North Macedonia, with Bosnia and Herzegovina, and with Montenegro, and with the whole of the region, with Albania, uh, uh, I mean, business people uh, from all the region as well. So our economy is very sustainable. Yes, there are some uh, processes that we need, especially when it comes to judicial reform, to uh, prevention of, uh, of the corruption. I fully agree with that. And we have this new government and the vast majority in parliament uh, try to reach the uh, consensus and to do those things that we need to, uh, to, to do because of our promises to our people. We are not you know, fools promising something and, uh, and you know, uh, uh, by the way, uh, uh, regaining the popularity in this country for last eight years in a row, because people will measure what's going on in Serbia. And uh, I think that democratic elections, at least Netherlands knows that, democratic elections are the best way how to, uh, how to measure and to prove what really people think. So thank you, thank very, you very much. much. You can count on Serbia in any aspect uh, in the in the most important uh, common European policies. As just just one sentence, please. We are participating Eurojust. We uh, Eurojust system. Europe. Minister, could I please uh, ask uh, you to no, 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 finish Europe, your statement? For, for, yes. Okay. Frontex and all other deeply. And I would say very importantly, those days, European policies, so you can count on Serbia. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And that's very reassuring to hear. Um, I'm looking at the clock and I think we should round up. But before we do so, I would like to give the panel uh, a, a final opportunity to, to, to make a final comment in uh, just one minute each. Um, um, so... Uh, really maximum one minute. Is there anyone in the panel, uh, Ms. Krivar, Ms. Lazarevich, Mr. Schmidt, who still would like to make a, a final point? Um, Mr. Schmidt? Um, yeah, well, maybe we didn't mention the conference on the future of Europe. This, that's also yes. something that, that is something of the Brussels bubble. And I don't think many EU citizens are aware that something like this exists. Yep. Um, but it could be interesting uh, to follow in what way the enlargement uh, issue will uh, creep in this, this discussion. My yeah. idea is that until now it's not an issue in, in this conference. Um, and I'm not sure if citizens will bring it up, but uh, it could be interesting. Could be interesting indeed, and we'll make sure to, to follow that closely. Uh, Ms. Grigoire, Ms. Lazarevic, I see you raising your, your hand first. So first Ms. Lazarevic, and then the final words to Ms. Grigoire. Thank you. Well, um, thanks to Mr. Schmidt for mentioning the Conference on the Future of Europe, and I was hoping actually that he would mention the necessity and the real need for the region to be included and involved in this process, as the candidate countries were involved in the uh, in the similar process which was going on with the convention uh, back uh, in the early 2000s. So far, the joint declaration between the institutions has not uh, mentioned uh, uh, including the Western Balkans uh, in this process. I doubt that enlargement policy as such will and the enlargement process will come up as one of the main priorities of the citizens of the EU in the process. But I think that for the sake of uh, uh, really creating a sense that the Western Balkans uh, uh, belongs uh, in the EU, uh, that it would be important to give uh, Western Balkan countries observer status uh, and uh, some sort of a, you know, uh, observer but uh, active participation uh, in this process. And I really do hope, I mean, I've advocated a lot uh, for this around the EU and in EU institutions. I hope that this will still come true. Thank you very much, Ms. Lazarevic. Uh, Ms. Gregoire, what, what do you make of today's discussion? How would you like to end? This is your opportunity. No, thank you. No, thank you. This was very useful. And Actually, it is. It's very comforting. I see a real commitment, uh, and, uh, and 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 we really trust um, to 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 see continuous changes in the coming period and engagement on reforms. And and if if you ask me, I think there is a huge opportunity for the Serbian government uh, in front uh, front of you. And uh, so, if you continue on this path, and um, and if you continue to deliver and show progress on the ground and bring a full track record uh, uh, in front of us. I think that that can bring you, Serbia, with all your potential closer to the end goal of joining in the European Union membership. And, and I think that is in our joint interest. And after all, 
the brightest future of the citizens of, Ser the citizens of Serbia lies in the European Union. So let's continue to work on that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Grégoire. Um, uh, please allow me to, as the moderator of discussion, also give my own assessment of, of today's uh, uh, conversation. I think a somewhat mixed picture emerges. I mean, the, the commitments as expressed by, by the keynote speakers and, and, and the other speakers here in, the, in, the, in, in this meeting are very pro promising and it's reassuring also um, looking at the audience that so many people joined us today here in this uh, in this meeting, which shows that there is actually an interest in the enlargement file here in the Netherlands and, and beyond. Um, at the same time, I, I cannot uh, avoid but to conclude that there will be some very difficult steps also ahead of us, uh, uh, of us in, um, in, uh, in the accession process of Serbia. But um, uh, one thing that I think uh, uh, almost all speakers agreed on is that the um, revised accession methodology may just about uh, may just be uh, uh, an opportunity to accelerate the process and uh, to make sure that the benefits of EU enlargement will be felt all over Serbia and within the EU as well. So uh, with those words, I would like to very much thank our keynote speakers and our panelists for, this inf for your inf informative insights and sharp views. Um, I strongly enjoyed discussing these issues with you and I would also um, I'd like to thank the audience for being here with us uh, today. Um, lastly, uh, special thanks to the Serbian Embassy here in The Hague for great cooperation in organizing this event and also major thanks to my colleagues at Klingendal without whom this would not have been um, possible. Um, this discussion will remain available on YouTube and we hope to organize many more discussions like this one. If you would like to stay up to date on the activities of Klingendal, uh, please subscribe to our newsletter via, via our website uh, www.klingendal.org. Um, thank, thank you all again for participating and I wish you a great evening. Goodbye.